Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse, for the purpose of becoming familiar with God's promises and the things that He has spoken forth that uh, He wants us to know about. And we have a perfect example here, where we're starting. We're we're starting the book of uh, Ezra. Technically, we're joining back in with the the Israelites uh, at the end of their seventy year uh, exile to Babylon. And uh, you know we've seen uh, in the scripture that God sent them there and told them you know you you didn't honor the the Sabbath rests of the land you know they they were supposed to let every seventh year they were supposed to let the land rest from harvesting crops they could they could pick and eat whatever grew by itself but they had to let uh, they couldn't harvest anything um, so all they could do was a year of gleaning if you will they could they could they could forage they could glean um, but they couldn't harvest and. Uh, God told them, I'm exiling you to Babylon for the exact number of years that you didn't let the land rest, which was 70. So God was given the land rest for 70 years. He was also exiled. The primary reason he exiled them was because they wouldn't obey his commands. And, and he gave them chance after chance after chance after chance. And then it just came to a breaking point where he said, we're done now. And um, and so we're joining back in right now, right where they're about to go back into uh, the promised land uh, uh, with the with a commission to rebuild the temple. And uh, first, let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness and mercy. I thank you, Father, that you are always with us, that your hand always guides us, Lord God, that you are very patient with us, um, that you uh, want us to uh, be fully aware of what it is that you are doing in the earth um, as far as we can comprehend and as far as we can know and as far as we should pray. And I thank you, Father God, for your revelation and uh, your insight as we read this word together and that you uh, cause things to jump out of this that would help us in what we are to do for you individually as people. And I thank you for that. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we are, like I said, we're technically we're starting Ezra, but I'm going to read according to the bookmark. It says before you read Ezra, so before you start Ezra, read chapter 45 of Isaiah. And the reason for that is because in chapter 45 of Isaiah, God talks about Cyrus, who uh, was a king, one of the Persian kings, and he's the one who sent the people back. But God prophesied about Cyrus by name before he was ever born, hundreds of years before he was born through the prophet Isaiah. And so we'll start with Isaiah chapter 45. God says, this is what the Lord says to Cyrus, the, his anointed one, whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear. Their fortresses, their, excuse me, their fortress gates will be opened, never to shut again. This is what the Lord says. I will go before you, Cyrus, and level the mountains. I will smash down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. And I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. And so, um, as we've seen before, and I've said this many times, so, you, you know, if you've, you've been with us for any length of time, you probably already understand this principle. God judges people differently than he judges nations. He, if a nation becomes wicked and starts causing more harm in the earth than good, he will raise up a, a rival nation to come and destroy that nation. And you see it happen all throughout history. And, uh, you know, like a lot of the nations that have been destroyed by another nation, if you start to research that nation toward the end, like what was their history right before they were taken over, you'll see that they were involved in a lot of stuff they shouldn't have, typically. So, uh, because this is just a general rule, I'm not saying that that's the way it happens every single time a nation is destroyed, but that is definitely a principle that God operates in, in the earth. Now, so generally speaking then, Cyrus is already going to be at the head of a nation that God was already using to do this. And so generally speaking, uh, all of those kings God had used to do this, but, I, but God is singling out Cyrus. And he tells him here, he says, I'll give you, in verse 3, he said, I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. I will do this so you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, the one who calls you by name. And why have I called you to, for this work? Why did I call you by name when you did not know me? It is for the sake of my servant Jacob, or for, for excuse me, for the sake of Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one. The reason I messed that phrase up was because I suddenly remembered that, uh, again, when God will, a lot of times he uses the word Jacob, the name Jacob, to signify the entire nation of Israel. He's not talking about Jacob as an individual. 
And so how can you tell when he does that? Because he, he uses the name Jacob and he also uses the name Israel. So he says, it is for the sake of Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one. So you know he's talking about his people. He says in verse 5, I am the Lord. There is no other God. I have equipped you for battle, though you don't even know me. So all the world from east to west will know there is no other God. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I create the light and make the darkness. I send good times and bad times. I, the Lord, am the one who does these things. So, um, you know, he says, I, I, I send good times and bad times. And so someone might say, well, then the bad times that we we come across in life is is from the Lord. No, you can't you can't interpret it that way because God is speaking to the head of a nation, and so He's talking about this in terms of nations, not individuals. See, uh, Jesus said, "In the world you'll have trouble," because it's the world. It's the it, the the world has sin in it, so it's be, just by living in this place we're going to have trouble. But uh, you know, Jesus also said, trials, tribulations must come, but woe to the one by whom they come. So in other words, the one who brings temptations and, and stuff like that, that's the one uh, who, you know, it's like woe to that person. And so they come through people, they come through Satan, but God does not tempt anyone. He said that in, in the, the book of James, he didn't tempt anybody. And so these bad times that God is talking about are to a nation that refuses to obey him. And so yeah that's that's that principle that's still that principle of judgment uh, upon a nation because he is talking to the head of a nation and so we need to interpret it in that light okay so verse 8 he said open up O heavens and pour out your righteousness let the earth open wide so salvation and righteousness can sprout sprout up together i the lord created them what sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator does a clay pot argue with its maker does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, Stop, you're doing it wrong? Uh, does the pot exclaim, How clumsy can you be? How terrible it would be if a newborn baby said to its father, Why was I born? Or if it said to its mother, Why did you make me this way? This is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel, and your Creator. Do you question what I do for my children? Do you give me orders about the work of my hands? I am the one who made the earth and created people to live on it. With my hands I stretched out the heavens. All the stars are at my command. I will raise up Cyrus to fulfill my righteous purpose, and I will guide his actions. I will restore my city and free my captive people without seeking a reward. Oh, no, sorry, I, I didn't say <laughs> I messed that up, didn't I? He said he will restore my city, so he's talking about Cyrus. I'm going to go ahead and start that verse over again because I messed that up. Praise God that when we make mistakes, God forgives us, amen, and so... Uh, I'll just go back up here to verse 13. He said, I will raise up Cyrus to fulfill my righteous purpose, and I will guide his actions. He will restore my city and free my captive people without seeking a reward. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. So God had already told him he's going to reward him anyway. But he's like, Cyrus is not going to seek this reward. So he's talking about, he is talking about this person who is not even born yet, this King Cyrus. He's like, I, I, I'm going to do all these things for you, Cyrus. And then, he, and then he starts talking about Cyrus and proclaiming he's going to do these things without seeking a reward. But God's already told him he's going to give him a reward. See, God, uh, God compensates those who work for him. Verse 14, this is what the Lord says. You will rule the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, and the Sabaeans. They will come to you with all their merchandise, and it will all be yours. They will follow you as prisoners in chains. They will fall to their knees in front of you and say, God is with you. And he is the only God. There is no other. And so, I mean, just to kind of put this into perspective, say you were the person that God called by name. Now, he has called you by name. He hasn't called you to the same purpose that he called Cyrus, probably. But he has called you to a purpose, and he has called you by name. And he's talking about these things that are going to take place, not because Cyrus is so great, but because God is great. And God is like, I'm going to use him to accomplish my purpose, and he, and he will fulfill it. In, in other words, he knows that Cyrus is going to do exactly what God has called him to do. And so uh, he's like, you'll rule the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Sabaeans. See, these were nations that uh, the, that kingdom had had trouble conquering in the past, you know. And so, I mean, but this is interesting. It would be like, um, you know, like, like say, uh, say you were in charge of, um, of like, uh, 
let's, let's try to think of a, of a country where the people might know where it is. Like say you were in charge of France and God said, the people in Spain are going to do what you say. The people in Germany are going to do what you say. The people in England are going to do what you say, you know? And so you know, think about that kind of, that kind of promise. I mean, even if he's like, just say your hometown, you know, like whatever town you're in, he's like, these three, these three towns that, that you live around are going to, all the people in those towns are going to do exactly what you tell them to do because of the purpose I've called you for, you know? And so that's, this is really a, a very powerful statement that God is making. Verse 15, truly, O God of Israel, our savior, you work in mysterious ways. All craftsmen who make idols will be humiliated. They will all be disgraced together, but the Lord will save the people of Israel with eternal salvation throughout everlasting ages. They will never again be humiliated and disgraced. For the Lord is God, and he created the heavens and earth and put everything in place. He made the world to be lived in, not a place, not to be a place of empty chaos. I am the Lord, he says, and there is no other. I publicly proclaim bold promises. I do not whisper obscurities in some dark corner. I would not have told the people of Israel to seek me if I could not be found. I, the Lord, speak only what is true and declare only what is right. And so, you know, here you have, you know, it makes me think of Jesus. He's like, uh, he, he's like, I, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know, he's like, I don't speak anything that's not true. And rightfully so, because he's, he's, uh, he is the son of God. He is God, you know, and uh, that's just, uh, the, I mean, it's someone, I mean, it was funny, it, came, it comes up every now and then, people say, does the Bible say anywhere that Jesus is God? Well, yeah, Jesus claimed to be God. If you read John chapter 8, he said, uh, he, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And the word I am was that ancient name for God that he gave them. He, he, Jesus knew exactly what he was saying. There's no confusion. He knew exactly what he was saying. That's why they took up stones to throw at him, because they were, they were like, you just claimed to be God. And uh, he did that more than once, by the way. Um, and so, uh, another thing that, that's interesting here, you know, God's like, I, I made the world to be lived in. He told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. He told Noah after the flood, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, you know? And so don't believe the people these days that say, oh, well, the earth is in danger of overpopulation. That's just, that's just complete nonsense. I've driven from one side of this nation to the other, and I've seen just vast expanses of just nothing. And they're trying to claim that there's not enough space for people on the earth. And so don't, don't believe that lie. It's just a lie. God's saying here, I, I made, this is the purpose of this planet. I made it for people to live in. It's what I, and he told them, be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say, be fruitful and multiply until you're afraid of overpopulation. That's just complete nonsense. Or as my grandma would say, hogwash. All right. Verse 20. Gather together and come, you fugitives from surrounding nations. What fools they are who carry around their wooden idols and pray to gods that cannot save. Consult together. Argue your case. Get together and decide what to say. Who made these things known so long ago? What idol ever told you they would happen? Was it not I, the Lord? For there is no other God but me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none but me. So who's this to? He's talking to people who are going to come after this prophecy he's making about this guy Cyrus because he's like because it's like, what's he saying here uh, he, he said uh, who, who made these things known so long ago what things what things is he talking about he's talking about what's going to happen concerning this king Cyrus and this is before Cyrus has ever been born so he's he's saying now now the who he's talking to is shifted to people who live after the time of Cyrus who see that Cyrus said exactly what God said he was going to do Go back, you Israelites, go back, you Jews, to your homeland and rebuild your temple. I'll make it happen for you. I'll help you to do it. And so uh, he's like, who, who made this known to you so long ago? We can look back in history. It's in, it's, in, it's in the annals of history. We could look at it and say, this prophecy came to pass, and it was God who's the one who told us it would come to pass. He, said, he told us right here in Isaiah 45. Verse 22, let all the world look to me for salvation. This is God speaking. He didn't say, let only the Jews look to me for salvation. He said, let all the world look to me for salvation. Now we know exactly why he's talking to the people of the earth and saying, who made these things known? It was I. Why did I let you, uh, why did I make it known to you? So that you would look to me for salvation. So he said, for I am God and there is no other. Verse 23, I have sworn by my own name. I have spoken the truth and I will never go back on my word. Every knee will bend to me. 
and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. The people will declare, the Lord is the source of all my righteousness and strength. Amen, and we do. We who trust in Jesus, we do. It's God, all the source of our righteousness is God. All the source of our strength is him. All who were angry with him will come to him and be ashamed. So that's the, that's the negative side of judgment. Those are the people who will, um, well, maybe not, maybe, I mean, I suppose it's possible for a person to be angry with God and then turn to him before the time. It's true. Verse 25, in the, in the Lord, all the generations of Israel will be justified. And in him they will boast. Yeah, the Bible says if, if uh, you must boast, boast in the Lord. Because uh, he's won a great victory for you. Jesus won everything for you at the cross. And so uh, you now have the opportunity to be in him and, and uh, make him the Lord of your life. And if you haven't done that, I strongly suggest you do so now. Just say out loud that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart God's raised him from the dead. And you'll be saved. That's what Romans uh, chapter 10 verse 9 says. So here in Ezra, so we've just finished Isaiah chapter 45, and that sets the stage for us to get back into Ezra because God was prophesying about this King Cyrus who was not born yet. But Cyrus is born in this time that we're about to read in Ezra. It says here in Ezra chapter 1 verse 1, In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah because he also prophesied through Jeremiah about Cyrus too. We just didn't read that one. We read the one in Isaiah. <laughs> he stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. This is amazing. This is a pagan king saying this. This is a king that, that is not a Jew. He is a king of a Gentile nation. And he is like, the God of heaven has given me all these things. This is an awesome, awesome proclamation. He said, again, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem and Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute toward their expenses by giving them silver and gold, supplies for the journey and livestock, as well as a voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. You know, I had someone uh, ask me one time, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't take the knowledge that we have for granted. You know, I had somebody ask me, are the Jews, is this, these people that we've been reading about all our lives, do they still exist in the earth? They do. They still exist in the earth. Just look at the nation of Israel. Those are the Jews. Those are God's chosen people. Most of them have not yet acknowledged that Jesus is the Messiah. There's coming a time when the majority of them will, and you can see that in the book of Revelation. Um, but for now, God's not finished with them yet. He, he they are, um, they are the other side of this, as you will. Jesus was talking, when Jesus was talking about, he was preaching to the Jews, and remember the, the early church, when the, the, when Jesus first ascended uh, back to heaven, uh, the, the, er, the early church was all Jews. They were, the, all the, the first Christians were Jews. And, um, there was, the, the entire church was Jews for, a, for a long time until Gentiles started coming in. And then there started being persecution against the Jews, even by Christians, and it's not biblical. If a per, uh, well, people who call themselves Christians, but any true Christian will love the Jewish people because uh, Jesus came from came through the Jews, and God is not finished with the Jews. And when Jesus was preaching to the Jews, he told them, um, he said, "I have others. I have I have others who are not a part of this flock." He said, "Them too, I must bring." So he was talking, and he said, "The two flocks will be one." And so he was talking about. That he was talking to the, the Jewish side of that flock. And then uh, he also said, there's others too that I must bring. He was talking about the Gentiles, anybody who is of non-Jewish birth. Any, any person who is not physically born uh, Jewish or Hebrew or Israelite, those are all the same, um, uh, same thing, then they are Gentiles. So us Christians who, do not, who are not of uh, Jewish descent, Physically speaking, we are Gentiles, but spiritually speaking, we are Jews, and Paul talks about that. But uh, so Christian, that's a little deep, I know, but but Paul talks about that in the New Testament, and so they are our brothers and sisters. We should, you know, in in the in the sense that they are still God's chosen people. Many of them have not accepted Christ yet, but the majority of them will one day, and so they are um, they are still part of God's plan, and they are still winnable to Jesus, if you will, and so. Uh, that's what we, one of the things we strive for. So, 
still back 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 to Ezra. Sorry about that. That was just a kind of important thing to talk about. So verse five. Then God stirred the hearts of the priests and Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. So God stirs the hearts of people to fulfill things in the proper time. But we always need to have our heart um, tender toward God, or you could say our heart, um, you know, kind of tuned to him to, you know, to, to be willing to do what he says when he tells us to do something. Don't try to fabricate something that. Well, I feel like I have to, I'm supposed to be doing something, but I don't know what it is. And so uh, this may be the thing. No, no, God will make it clear. If it's important enough that he wants you to do it, he will make it clear when he is telling you to do something. Don't try to make something up and because you'll end up in a, in a world of trouble if you do that. Just uh, delight in God's word where you are. Uh, if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing right now, just delight in God's word where you are. Just delight in God himself. And eventually he will tell you what to do. Amen. So he says here, uh, I'll read that verse five again. So then God stirred the hearts of the priests and Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord and all their neighbors assisted by giving them articles of silver and gold supplies for the journey and livestock. Some people are goers, some people are senders and the senders will uh, bless the, the goers with the things that they need in order to do what God's sending them to do. So they gave them many valuable gifts in addition to all the voluntary offerings. King Cyrus himself brought out the articles that King Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Lord's temple in Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his own gods. Those are the same articles used for worship that God, it says that God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to take them from the temple and bring them to Babylon. So then Babylon eventually became, uh, kind of fell and then, you know, from the inside and then uh, was taken over by Persia. And now we're, this is the kingdom of Persia, Cyrus is, uh, the Persian king. So he has control of everything that King Nebuchadnezzar had before him. Verse 8, Cyrus directed Mithridas, the treasurer of Persia, to count these items and present them to Sheshbazar, the leader of the exiles returning to Judah. This is a list of the items that were returned. 30 gold basins, 1,000 silver basins, 29 silver incense burners, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls and 1,000 other items. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and silver. Sheshbazar brought all these along with the exiles. Uh, wait, brought all these along when the exiles returned from Babylon to Jerusalem. And so um, that actually is, is the end of that chapter. And, you know, I, I really wanted to, I, knew, I didn't know how much time we would have because I, I, I knew that chapter one of Ezra was short. But I also wanted to spend some some time in Isaiah 45 because I knew that we would be able to talk about that for quite a while um, because uh, Cyrus was uh, allowing them to do this, you know. And if you look at the end of Second uh, Kings, it gives sort of the same beginning part that Cyrus allowed them to come back at the end of Second Chronicles right here. It does the same thing where you've got these chapters. In fact, I'm not sure if it does that in Second Kings. I'm curious. I'll just go back a couple of books here. There's Second Chronicles, First Chronicles. Second Kings, at the end of Second Kings. No, actually, in Second Kings, it doesn't do that. In the end of Second Chronicles, it gives a like it 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 talks about when Cyrus allows the people to come back, and so um, that's kind of why I took that segue where we spent some time in the Book of Psalms, spent some time in the Book of Proverbs, because um, you have this seventy-year gap, you know, where the people are sent to Babylon. And then 70 years later, they're sent back. And so there's this long gap. And so I thought, well, probably a good idea to spend some time in the, in the poetry books or the, some, some people call them the wisdom literature books, um, you know, because that way it kind of give us that feeling of we've, we've, we've been away from them for a while. We've kind of left them for a while. Now we can, now we can come back, you know, so um, awesome, awesome to see. I mean, God's promise there is just so awesome to see it come to its fulfillment. Um, and uh, we can do the same thing. We can look and say, look, God made promises for us too. We know that he will bring it to pass. God said in Isaiah 45, when, you know, basically when I make a promise, I do not go back on it. Now, whether we take advantage of the, the fruits of the promise that he gives us, that's, that's up to us. Because everything that we have to receive from God, we have to believe what he said. We have to have faith. You can only receive things by faith. The Bible says in Hebrews that it's impossible to please God without faith. And so... Um, that is what we must do. We must uh, find out what he said, believe what he said, and keep believing until we see it come to pass. But we have to believe it's already come to pass in a sense.
because in the sense that God's word is absolute truth and he will not turn back on it, it's as good as done in that sense. And that's how we receive by faith, because we say, okay, God, you said it. That's good enough for me. I believe it. I believe that I've received it. I'm going to keep thanking you and praising you until I actually see it come. But it's as, but for right now, it's as good as though I already have it. And that's the way you have to look at it if you're going to receive anything from God. Because it says that uh, Abraham believed God. God told Abraham, I'm going to multiply you into multiple nations. You'll be the father of many nations. And it says Abraham believed God. And God counted it to him for righteous, he, righteousness. He's like, okay, you're righteous because you believe me 100% and you didn't turn back. So there we are. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you, Lord, that you are always here, that you're always listening, that you are always speaking still. It's all through your word. You are speaking to us even now through this word. And I thank you, Father, that you are faithful. I thank you that you always keep your promises. You always keep your word. And if we fail to receive those things, it's not your fault, Lord God. You've made it all available to, for us to receive by faith. And we just need to find out the things you've told us that we can believe you for. And I thank you for them all. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys. And we will see you again.